Russian nationalism and the Russian-Ukrainian war, autocracy, orthodoxy, nationality. Author, Taras Kuzio. Publisher, Taylor and Francis Rutledge. Country, the United Kingdom. Language, English. This timely and relevant book places imperial nationalism and chauvinism at the center of Putin's Russia and identifies them as the driving pretext for the February 2022 invasion of Ukraine. The book highlights a Tsarist white Russian imperial denial of the existence of a distinct Ukrainian nation as reflected in Putin's obsession with Ukraine. The author traces the intensification of Russian chauvinism towards Ukraine and Ukrainians through three critical junctures in Putin's political career. The book investigates nationalism within the Russian Orthodox Church and pinpoints the dangerous rise of the red, white, brown, Soviet, Tsarist, fascist, nationalist coalition under Vladimir Putin. The author, Taras Kujo, is with us tonight and I invite him to say a few words about the book. Um, I, I th thank you for the Peterson Literary Fund for including me on this year's short list of books. I have a, a kind of an amusing story behind this book, which I hope you'll stick with as I'm presenting it. Um, over the last sort of 10 plus years, I've been noticing the growth of this um, re rehabilitation, revival of white Russian emigre nationalism. The first juncture uh, of the three junctions I talk about came after the Orange Revolution. So we're going back a long period of time. But remember that the entire, and I mean entire, Western academia who involved in Russia historians and political scientists have completely ignored this topic. In fact, many, I would say many academics have actually denied and downplayed um, any claims that there was a growth of nationalism in Putin's Russia, however unbelievable that is today. So this is the only book, and it sounds a bit arrogant, but it is the only book that goes into that white Russian emigre change of Russian nationalism. Because this is worse than in the Soviet Union. In the Soviet Union, Ukrainians were described as a distinct people. Ukrainian language was described as a distinct language. Of course, there was Russification. Of course, there was uh, national discrimination and repression. Ukraine was a founding member of the UN in 1945. It was supposedly had sovereignty within the USSR. What we have now is a return to pre-Soviet denial of the existence of Ukraine and Ukrainians. So the, now comes a humorous part. My first ever article was published in a journal in London that none of you have ever heard of, called the Ukrainian Review. The Ukrainian Review was the British version, shall we say, of the Ukrainian Quarterly in the US. I published it back, <laughs> you're not going to believe this, 1980. And it's all about the same topic of this book. And I thought to myself, what I wrote about and was interested in back then is now becoming reality in Putin's Russia. But who provoked me to have an interest in that Russian chauvinism and Russian imperial nationalism? was my father. I grew up in nationalist Ukrainian Britain, where one political party was very much dominant. So I grew up in that milieu. But of course, as I went to university, I rebelled against that, um, that nationalism. Well, guess what? My father was right. I was wrong. So before, and this is the first time you've ever heard an academic say he was wrong. <laughs> so before my father passed away a couple of years ago, I went up to him and said, Dad, you were always right. I was wrong about the Russians. And he didn't live to see the invasion, thank God. I, I buried him in Ukraine. His, his wish was to be reburied in Ukraine last year. Um, 
But everything I was taught in that nationalist community in Great Britain has come to be seen to be true. Everything. And, and even more. Everything. Um, so the book traces these three critical junctions of how Putin moved further and further to the right to what we have today, which is a fascist totalitarian dictatorship. Um, the first came after the Orange Revolution with a reaction against, sorry, against the Orange Revolution and we saw this with the creation of the Russian world in, in, which was supposed to bring together these three Eastern Slavs um, in, 19, in 2007, sorry. Well, actually, th this wasn't a new idea. In 1990, a year before the USSR collapsed, Alexander Zolzhenitsyn called for the USSR to be replaced by a Russian Union. Putin's Russian world is Zolzhenitsyn's Russian Union. There's no difference. And not surprising, Zolzhenitsyn and Putin were buddies um, towards the end of Zolzhenitsyn's life. Um, the second juncture comes in 2012, I write about, with Putin's return to, to, his, to the presidency. And he moves even further to right, begins financing far-right groups in Europe, uh, goes on an anti-LGBT crusade, goes sort of an anti-Western xenophobia, and of course, he begins to think of himself as going into history as the gatherer of Russian lands. Here by Russian, he means Eastern Slavic. So the Obshiruski Narod, the all Russian nation composed of great Russians, little Russians, and white Russians. This is his goal after 2012. He thought he'd done it with Yanukovych. So I write about this very important period. But of course, he, he, he forgot that <laughs> Ukrainians are not Russians. And so he provoked the Euromaidan. I remember those days very, very much. I was in Kiev at the time for that one million demonstration. I, I filmed it on my phone and emailed it to CTV and you, they showed it here. Um, the goal was to get Yanukovych to turn his back on the EU association agreement, become re-elected, and then take Ukraine into the Eurasian Union. If there hadn't have been a Euro Maidan, Ukraine would have been lost then. But Ukrainians uh, rose up. But we already saw the beginnings of what we've got now, whereby it wasn't like the Orange Revolution. The Euromaidan was supported by everybody in Ukraine. The Orange Revolution was more Western Central Ukrainians. The third junction is 2020, where Putin creates a fascist dictatorship, changes the constitution, uh, he, he, Putin becomes president for life de facto, and, and Russia goes off the, off the scales. That's when the, that plus Putin's isolation under COVID, um, where he probably read too many of these white Russian emigre books, which were, by the way, mass, mass reprinting in Russia for, for over 10 years, circulated amongst schools, uh, the army, and elsewhere. Um, and then the preparations for the invasion began in the summer of 2021 when he, when he published his long and horrible essay. Ironically, that was the first time Western journalists and policymakers began to understand what the hell was going on. First time. But ladies and gentlemen, the genocide we have today has a background which was ignored by Western scholars and policymakers. Just like with the Holodomor, just like with the Holocaust, there is, there's a long period of dehumanization beforehand. And that dehumanization has been taking place since the Orange Revolution on Russian television, where Ukraine and Ukrainians don't exist, or they're laughed at, or they're just described as run by Nazis or puppets of Washington. If you watch, and I'm sure nobody does, but if you, if you go on social media and find clips of Russian TV, every day, there are calls for genocide against Ukrainians. The orange, origins of this are this long gestation of dehumanization, which I go into um, in the book. So although we're all shocked and surprised, there's a history to what's been taking place. It's an evolution 
backwards to the depths of that white Russian sort of uh, emigre Russian nationalism. So um, I, again, um, <laughs> um, when I was, uh, thankfully the COVID epidemic was an opportunity to write books like this because you couldn't do anything else. Um, but I remember my father, um, who wasn't alive at that time, whispering in my ear, saying, just keep writing, just keep writing. So, our final thing I'll say is life is a circle. I've come back to where I was many, many years ago, from my upbringing um, in Great Britain. And this book is testimony to how those Ukrainian diaspora were right about Russia and Russians. Thank you.